Great. Well, thanks so much for having us. My name is Rick Eilertsen, as Trudy had mentioned. Um, I'm a municipal engineer, um, been, been in the municipal engineer practice for about 30 years, and I've really been focusing on stormwater the last probably 20 years. And uh, um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, one of the reasons that we're here is actually because of the city of Verona's stormwater permit. Um, they do need to, to provide education, stormwater education to, to, to city of Verona residents and, you know, obviously anybody that, that else is here um, and, you know, basically to have them understand, you know, some of the different uh, issues that stormwater brings to it and, and also identify some of the opportunities to, to help uh, alleviate some of the issues that stormwater has. And so obviously tonight we're talking about uh, native plants. Um, we, we do, we, we're trying to have um, AECOM serves as a city engineer for the city of Verona, and so one of the services that we provide is to provide um, programs like this, um, both adult theme, obviously, which is more tonight's theme, um, but then also kids activities, and so we've got some different uh, kids programs planned for, for, the, for this year as well on, on different things, and I think with that I'll also in introduce Mercedes Kennedy. Mercedes has been helping us out on a lot of our, especially a lot of our native vegetation work, both wetland delineations, as well as uh, um, we have, do a lot of DOT work for identifying vegetation management practices and, and what, how, how those are, 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 are improving, hopefully improving um, some of the, the rights of way, um, especially along the state, state highways that we have here in Wisconsin. So Mercedes has been a, a really huge asset in, in uh, helping us with that. Anything else that you um, I'm an environmental scientist, I guess okay. that's my, my title, but yeah, I do some wetland work and then some also native um, plant kind of vegetation work. So yeah. Yeah. Well, with that, um, we'll get, so actually I've got a couple of different uh, photos here. These photos are all um, from, actually these, these are all from Dane County's uh, um, facility at Fennel Court uh, or Fennel Drive. And th th there's a number of different, there's pollinator gardens there, there's, there's uh, rain gardens, there's like 12 or so different types of gardens, Mo, you know, some with native plants, like the ones that I've got shown. Then there's also some, some non-native plants. There's edible gardens, um, things like that. So it's a great one. You know, if you want to just see everything all in one spot, that's a great location um, kind of on the southeast side of Madison to be able to go and visit. You know, it's obviously you know, open, you know, during daylight hours, it's probably best to, to look at them unless you get a really high powered flashlight. Um, but uh, some really good opportunities to, to see what, you know, some different uh, um, things about, you know, just different native plants and also some non-native plants. Um, this is on a tour that I was involved with uh, last summer, um, just some different uh, private residences that had, that have been incorporating native, native plants. So let me see, it was working. <laughs> yeah, let's just... Okay. All right. So I guess let's start with the, the beginning. So why would you want to use native plants in your yard or garden or something like that? Um, so native plants are really beneficial because they're adapted to our local conditions. You know, a lot of these plants have been here for before we were here. So they are really well um, adapted to the soil conditions here, the climate here, um, precipitation patterns and all those things. So um, they're going to be really well suited for any kind of environment that you have that's native to this area. Um, along with that, they're really good ecologically because they promote um, foraging for insects, um, having pollen and bees. Um, they also are beneficial for birds because of the seeds that, you know, they drop later in the season. So those are some really great reasons. And then over winter, it's really beneficial because they provide habitat for um, different animal species that um, can kind of take shelter within the native vegetation that's kind of left remaining throughout the winter time. Um, as well as they protect pest, um, some insects from pesticide exposure, um, whether it's like through agriculture where they're spraying for different um, pests there, um, they can kind of use that as a safe, use native plants as a safe haven for um, pesticide exposure. And then on the stormwater side of things, um, native plants can help reduce stormwater runoff rates. So like the speed at which, um, water can run off and cause erosion, and then as well as the amount or volume of runoff that you get um, during a heavy rainstorm. So native plants can help um, kind of reduce those rates through their root system, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more, as well as they can improve the um, quality of stormwater. So similarly through their root system, which kind of acts as a filtration system. And then finally, um, 
they're a lot lower maintenance than regular kind of turf grass that you would see in a front lawn. Um, you know, you don't have to kind of mow them or do any kind of watering for native plants that um, after you've been, after they're well, like, well established, um, they're a lot easier to maintain. Maybe just like one mowing kind of early in the springtime, but then after that, they're kind of do their own thing. So really beneficial that way. And that's really the key is, is once they're established, native plants do take, you know, do take a while to, uh, to get established. You know, once they're established, like Mercedes mentioned, um, they can be a much lower maintenance. So, you know, basically one of the, the, the great benefits, you know, one of the, one of the things we're up against for, you know, a small motor engineers is identifying ways to make um, this, basically the, the, the picture on the left, um, an urban environment with a lot of impervious areas you know, between building roofs and parking, parking lots, um, sidewalks, you know, street pavement, you know, that adds, because it's all impervious, water doesn't go down into the ground like it would in a in a you know in a native prairie or even a meadow, meadow um, basically or woodland area. Um, so by by changing some regrading potentially um, to put in rain gardens and basically trying to, we're basically trying to emulate what nature had had been before before man and woman came and and uh, and, and paved it over right. And uh, Mercedes can talk probably a, a lot more about this, but basically um, one of the nice things about native vegetation, there's obviously, there, depending on the type of species, American Mercedes will talk a little bit about some of the different uh, species um, that, that, are, that, that at least we'd recommend for you to consider in, in your yard or in your, in your landscaping. Um, some, of these, some of the species can get, uh, you know, like this one, for example, I've seen this get 14 feet tall, mm -hmm. but you know, think about how tall that is, and then also think about the the depth that the that the roots can go. I've seen, you know, I've heard about roots going down as, as deep as 26 feet below ground. When you, you compare that to you know what you know typical lawn lawn uh, species, you know, usually Kentucky bluegrass is the most common you know lawn species. Well, you know that's you know it may get up to six inches high if you don't mow it like in the normal way. Um, but roots basically anywhere, you know, or, you know, anywhere from two to I've seen roots go down as, as deep as six inches if, if they've got, you know, you know, good, if, you know, a, better, a more, you know, just a better, but that's about as deep as, as the Kentucky bluegrass that we're going to go. So it's a huge difference in, in that, uh, in basically how the roots act. Um, and then we can, and maybe I'll go, go to the next slide, Mercedes, and then. This is kind of a cool photo. This is actually at the U.S. Botanic Garden, or was. I think it's, it was just a five-year display there in Washington, D.C. And you can literally see the actual plants. So, so they've actually washed out the soil from the native plants. And you can see both what's above ground or what was above ground. And then also the depth of the roots. And obviously, this is, I think this is maybe 10 feet um, high here. Um, and, and you can see that a lot, number of the different roots species um, they had to basically, you know, braid the, the, the roots up. So you can, I mean, it just gives you a sense for both the depth of the, of the roots that the, that the roots can go, but also the mass of the roots. And one of the, the huge benefits of native plants is that, you know, about a third of the, the roots actually die off every year. So what that means is those, those channels, those vertical channels then allow for, for you know, both insects and, and, uh, and, and, and you know, you know, macrovertebrates to go, to go down, but also water to go down. So it, and it basically loosens the soil. Um, and there's actually studies done right here in the Madison area um, of, of the improvements to, to infiltration that native vegetation has provided over a period of five years, it almost it made the infiltration rate almost double from being in a clay soil. Even. So clay does, you know, pre present somewhat of a barrier for certain species, even native species. But but with enough with with enough time and 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 uh, energy, you know, even native roots can go can get through deep, you know, somewhat compacted clay. So, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where native plants can be helpful. Um, this is one of the tours that I was involved with last, last uh, summer um, to be able to just, you know, see a number of different places um, in the area that, that just so people can get an idea of what, you know, what different people have done and have found successes on and, you know, some not so, not so successful areas. The next one. So one of the, the things that's somewhat, at least in my opinion, somewhat new is there's been 
quite a bit of uh, discussion about downspout gardens. You know, hopefully, most people are aware that that just by if you have a downspout that's draining onto your driveway and then out out, out uh, into the street, that none of that water is getting is getting captured and, and infiltrated into the soil. So you know we've been talking about for twenty years about re just just simple things like redirecting your downspout and onto your grass lawn. Well, again, you know one thing that's even better than than you know discharging it on your grass lawn. Is to actually discharge it, you know, make it, make, you know, dig out even if it, even if it's like a five foot by five foot area, dig out that soil, loosen it up, and maybe amend that soil um, to to add in some compost. Compost is really good for pretty much any type of vegetation. It both it, it uh, helps with the pH of the soil and allows it to be much more, you know, much easier for for the for the roots to go go down. It also um, is a lot has a lot better. Um, life in it. So, you know, different types of um, things like mycorrhizae um, will, will actually um, survive better in, in compost and soil. So just, you know, simple things like that. And, and so there, here's some information on that downspout garden. Oh, it is working now. So another thing is the rain gardens. We've been talking about this for, you know, well, Roger Bannerm, I don't know if any, has anybody ever heard of Roger Bannerm? He was a DNR employee. And, and then later, after he retired from DNR, he helped you at the USGS uh, and a number of different studies, but Roger's probably the preeminent rain garden, you know, the father of the rain garden, especially in the Madison area. He was one of the first people that, that put in a rain garden on his property back now, probably 25 years ago. I was working for the city of Fitchburg in 2009, and he was just in the process of, of changing out his first rain gardens because he had some really tall species of, of, uh, of plants, um, rosin weed and a couple other ones that were quite tall. That, he, that were in his front uh, rain garden, you know, and, and he was wanted to change that up and get some different things. So I was able to to uh, basically dig up a number of the different plants and then incorporate those into Fishburg's community rain garden. So that's another spot that people could, could go check up. So in front of the community center in, in Fishburg, there's a basically a demonstration rain garden that was designed that you know, talks about uh, where the plants came from and then uh, you know, the process that the city has for allowing people to, to, to gather seed if they want um, and potentially to, 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 to separate out uh, plants with permission. Um, but anyway, basically the rain garden is, is creating a depression in the yard so that, and then, you know, usually you dig out the soil and then put it on the berm. So for example, if there's this, you know, flows to the right, you might, you know, take your soil out of here, put a berm in, basically you're getting a depression from, you know, anywhere from in the six inch range Generally, not more than eight, 18 inches. You know that I've seen rain gardens be six, still successful, but you have to have sandier soils in order for that not to be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, and then there's obviously different different zones in there. But you know, it's really important to understand what the soil conditions are, what the you know what the moisture conditions are. If you've got you know high groundwater, that's you know those, those are some different things. You want to be the rain gardens and even the downspout gardens. You want to be at least 10 feet away from your foundation. You don't want to introduce that water. Where it's going to be a problem, you know, coming into your house, right, or your your, your basement. Um, so there's a couple of different things. Maybe I'll do that. Um, and this is actually this is just a, a a plan view. So if you're looking from way up in the sky down on your property, um, you know, again taking your downspout and then you know grading in a, a rain garden. So you dig out the soil here and then maybe pay, put a berm around to form the your rain garden. And then basically, imagine, you know, really depending on that soil, if you've got really clay soils, it's good. If it's sand or, or kind of silty, loamy material, it's not as critical, but definitely if you've got clay, you know, probably any, any one to infiltrate well, you want to probably amend the, that soil adding compost in. Um, and again, similarly, um, you know, the backside. This one, you know, shows about, you know, over 30 feet. Um, but again, it really kind of depends how susceptible your, your foundation walls are to, to, to let you drain it. Yeah, and I've got, a, I've got an old Victorian home with field snow on the walls. So I want to, you know, I keep my, my, my drainage, at least for the first 10 feet, as, as positive away from the house as possible. So minimize the, the, the water coming into the, into the basement. Another option is terrace rain gardens. So, you know, with permission from, from the municipality that you're in, there may be opportunities to actually plant that in. 
um, in native native vegetation. It's typically it's you know you're, you, as a as a homeowner you're typically responsible for the for the, the maintenance of that vegetation anyway. And so if there's you know again you do need to make sure you review any any uh, ordinances that the that your community has. Uh, or against native plants and, and then follow, make sure you're following those. And sometimes there's permit programs that you'd uh, go by and, and uh, to make sure that, that, you know, you're not putting that energy into something that you're going to have to rip out you know, in, the, in the near future. Another option is uh, very popular lately is the pollinator garden. So looking at uh, creating habitat for, for birds, bees, um, other insects and that, uh, you know, pollinate uh, vegetation. Um, and so this is a, uh, uh, I thought it was a pretty cool display of, 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 uh, of in, in some different information on pollinator gardens. Um, and just recently, Michelle Probst uh, from Dane County um, created a, a Google map um, that's available on Dane County web page, where you can actually see different demonstration uh, teaching gardens, you know, they're basically pollinator gardens. So, so checking, you know, combination of rippleeffects.com um, and Dane County's, uh, you know, just do a, a search for Dane, Dane County pollinator or something like that would, would probably get, get you to that site. So you can actually go in and, and get some information on each of these little dots that are there. And, and Michelle, you know, if you find some that aren't on there, you know, just let Michelle know and she can, she can add those in. Proceeding next. Yeah, sure. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about um, plants. And I guess it's just a fun tool that you can use. Um, a few apps that are available for uh, plant identification, whether it's flowers or trees even. I actually use the Seek by iNaturalist app and it works pretty well to get you at least to like the family or genus level. Um, it's kind of fun to use whether like you're growing something and you kind of want to know what it is or something's already in your yard or if you're just even out on a hike or a walk kind of just seeing what plants are growing around your neighborhood. So um, that's really a good resource. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, and then kind of where can you get plants? We're going to talk about the plant species in a couple slides, but um, starting off, where can you get plants? Um, plant, plant Dane is a really cool um, program that goes that goes on around um, the surrounding area. And they, I think starting next week in February, you can order um, plants from their plant list. They have um, different wildflowers, grasses, legumes, and sedges, which are kind of more of like a wetland grass. But um yeah, they have, um, you can buy seed packets now apparently, and they also have plant kits which are available, which are pretty much just like the small plants that have already had their seeds germinated. Um, you can get them for different kind of um, conditions, whether you have some like sunny spots or more shaded spots or um, different moisture conditions in your soil as well. So that's a really good um, resource that Rick's gonna talk a little bit more about later as well. And then um, Plant Dane does have a limited supply. So if you aren't able to get them through Plant Dane, there's some other cool resources, the UW Arboretum has um, a native plant sale that takes place in May. So that's an option. And then also we have um, a list here that the DNR put together of um, plant nurseries that are in Wisconsin kind of throughout the, the state. So they have it broken up through by region, which is really cool. Um, we have two examples here, just of, sorry, two examples here of two nurseries, um, Agricole and um, Prairie Moon Nursery. They similarly kind of do like a plant kit where you can get little um, saplings of different wildflowers or native plants, and they also have seeds available. So those are just a couple of options as to where you can get um, different native plants. And then um, another one that's actually kind of cool that is going on in the Madison Public Libraries, I think um, this is a newer program, but they actually have seed libraries going on um, at a few of their locations. So these are the libraries in Madison that have the seed, library, the seed libraries available. Um, and they just have a couple of species listed here, um, Black-Eyed Susan, Blue Vervain, Rattlesnake Master, um, Wild Bergamot or Bee Balm, and Yellow Plum Flower. And I think a few of them might have some other additional species, but those are all seeds. And I think those are actually free. So um, if you go to one of those libraries and they're there, I think you can just take them. And I think the idea is that, you know, eventually once your plants flower and you can collect seeds, you can kind of like exchange with the neighbor or take them back to the library and kind of keep the seed library going. So that's kind of a full, a cool interactive way to get involved with, um, you know, local plants and now a few examples of different plants that might be beneficial to um, plant. This is um. That'll be a test later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is actually from um Xerxes organization. They have a lot of really cool resources available on their website. Um, this is one that they put together with, I believe, um, University of Minnesota, and it's about just pollinator conservation. So they kind of go over um 
yeah, there's a lot of plans here. I'm just going to couple cover a few that are kind of um, more popular ones and ones that we're going to talk about a little bit more later on too. So um, the first one here is milkweed. I think a lot of people know of milkweed. That's kind of been the poster child for um, pollinator success with the monarch butterfly. So there's a couple of cool species of milkweed that we're going to talk about. Um, the little star there means that it's like a pollinator superfood. And then the caterpillar means that it's a host plant for butterflies and um, moth caterpillars. So um, that's one example, milkweed plants. Um, and then purple cone flower is a really pretty one. I think um, it's a nice purple flower. That one's also a pollinator superfood. Um, lupin, wild lupin is one that is a host plant for the corner blue butterfly, which is actually a federally endangered species in Wisconsin. Um, we'll look at pictures of that one later. And then there's wild bergamot or bee balm, the other one that circled there. Um, that's a really cool plant. Um, also kind of a really good pollinator friendly plant and um, good for, oops, oh yeah, there we go. And then these last two here that are circled are um, goldenrod and asters. There's quite a few species of both of those. Um, they're both really um, good because they bloom later in the season in the fall, which is something that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind if you're going for um, some native plantings, you kind of want to have plants that bloom throughout the season so then they provide enough um, resources for the different pollinators that are going to be, you know, looking for things later in the season. Um, and then I just covered some of the wildflowers, but this also shows different trees and shrubs that would be beneficial as well as grasses. And usually if, you know, there has a flower on these plants at any time during the season, they're really good to have for pollinator success. And then this bottom one is just um, kind of pollinator friendly edible plants that you could use in your garden. Um, I'm actually not sure if all of these will um, work in Madison or in Wisconsin because this is for like the whole Midwest. So including like Southern Illinois and everything. So, um, but these are just some of the, um, some examples of plants that you could use in your garden that would also be beneficial for uh, pollinators and pollinator conservation. All right, and now a little bit about specific plants. Um, these are separated by soil conditions. So if we're gonna start off with um, plants that are kind of more suitable for a dry, a drier condition or a low water condition. Um, the first one here is wild lupin, which I kind of mentioned earlier. That's one that is um, a host plant to the carnivore butterfly. So that one's a really cool one. Um, one thing that I am not covering here, I guess, which Rick kind of mentioned earlier is the different soil conditions. Um, some of these plants might not work depending on what conditions of soil you have in your yard. For example, the wild lupin, I think is kind of better in sandier soils. Um, so if you have like really like heavy clay soil, you might have a hard time getting this plant to look like it does in this picture or even like germinate. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> and then the lupin will get about uh, one to three feet tall. So it's a sh little bit shorter, um, but really pretty and great for pollinators, like I mentioned. Um, the next one here is uh, butterfly weed. So butterfly weed and this milkweed here are both in the milkweed family. So those are both great for um, monarch butterflies and other pollinators too. Um, the butterfly weed stays a little bit shorter, around two to three feet, and I think the common milkweed gets a little bit taller. That one's a pretty common one that you see a lot around um, the Madison area, too. Um, and then we have lead plant over here, which is I can name myself, lead plant over here, which is a pretty purple one. Um, that one will stay a little bit shorter, I think also around one to three feet. And then some, same with uh, purple prairie clover. Um, those are both really pretty purple flower. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that'll be about one to two feet. And then smooth aster over to the right is in the aster family, like I mentioned before. Um, those ones are great for um, kind of blooming later in the fall. And then, um, yeah, that one will be about probably two to three-ish feet also. And then moderate soil conditions. So these are ones that are probably going to be the easiest to kind of get established in any kind of garden that you do just because they're a little bit more flexible. Um, they're not too finicky with uh, whether it's really wet or really dry. Um, so starting with the Black Eyed Susan here, um, Black Eyed Susan and Purple Coneflower and actually Cup Plant are all kind of sunflower-ish looking plants. So those are really great for um, producing like seeds for birds later on in the season. Um, but Black Eyed Susan, like I mentioned, that one um, is a little bit shorter. That one will probably be around um, one to three feet ish tall. Um, purple coneflower, probably about the same, um, maybe a little bit taller, maybe up to like four feet about. Um, cup plant here with the monarch butterfly. Um, those ones get pretty tall. So <laughs> be wary if you want to plant those ones. They have really pretty. Yeah, yeah. They'll start maybe smaller, but yeah, they will get, they can get very tall. So 
um, a nice pretty like yellow sunflower kind of, but um, also great for birds later in, in the fall time. Um, a prairie blazing star, I think this one is actually one that, well, not prairie blazing star, but some of the other blazing star species will are um, available through the plant name program. So um, they have like a similar pretty purple flower. That's actually one of my favorite plants. Um, I think that one's really cool. And then Culver's root down here in the bottom, the white one, that one will get a little bit taller, I think more like three to four to five feet maybe. Um, and then these bottom two are kind of like I mentioned before, asters and goldenrods. They're both great for fall time um, just because they're a little bit later blooming. And the New England aster is actually a really cool one because it kind of will be purple and sometimes it will be like a more magenta pink color, which is really nice. And then showy goldenrod, there's quite a few species of goldenrod. Um, and that's just one that uh, we have up here, so. And then here are a couple plants that are more um, kind of ready for high water or wet conditions, kind of leaning more towards a wet prairie or wetland kind of situation. Um, Olin Alexander up in the top, that one, um, that one gets around one to three feet. So it's a little bit uh, shorter stature, but it actually, I do want to mention that one looks similar to a invasive plant that we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, so I just want to make sure everyone's aware of that. That This one's going to be a lot smaller than um, the wild parsnip, which is an invasive plant. Um, this one's a native one. It's great because it blooms earlier in the springtime. Um, so it's good for pollinators that way. Um, great blue lobelia is a really cool plant. That one usually is around one to two feet, so not too tall. Um, and I think that one actually attracts hummingbirds, if I'm not mistaken. It's really similar to cardinal flower as well, which is like a bright red flower. Um, and those ones are really cool. Um, so that's kind of a fun one if you can get that one to grow in your yard. Joe pieweed is um, a little bit taller. That one I think gets up to about six inch or six feet, sorry, yeah. six feet. Um, but that's more of a kind of a wetland, wet prairie plant, pretty pink flowers though. And then swamp milkweed, same in the milkweed family. So that's gonna be great for monarchs and other po pollinators. Um, and then wingstem is a similar wetland kind of plant, but also has a sunflower flower. And I think that one gets a little bit taller, closer to um, somewhere between like three and five, six feet maybe. And then also want to touch on a few of the like invasive plants or weeds that you might see growing in your yard or might be um, try to creep into your garden. Um, there's curly dock up here. Reed canary grass is pretty, um, can be pretty aggressive and invasive, especially in like more wetland or wet soil situations. Um, Canada thistle, Queen Anne's lace, or like wild carrot, I think it's also known as um, giant ragweed. And that's actually, I think, one of the culprits of hay fever that we get, a lot of people get in the fall. Um, and then over in the um, right there is wild parsnip, like I mentioned earlier. It kind of has a similar flower as that golden Alexander, but the wild parsnip is going to be a lot taller and bigger flower for the most part. Um, and that one you'd want to avoid um, whenever you see it because it can cause like a sun blister on your skin if you get exposed to the, like the sap that's within the stem. And then Japanese knotweed is the last one we have here. Yeah, and I learned about wild parsnip actually while, while I was working on uh, laying out the lower vaginal creek sanitary receptor. I was trudging through, through some private properties out there and, and uh, it was sunny. Um, it was hot, I was sweating, and uh, I didn't know what wild parsnip was before, but uh, after I got a one inch, you know, by one inch blister on my, my forearm, I, <laughs> and it lasted for about a month, <laughs> and I got to know it pretty well, <laughs> but much, much better than I, than I ever hoped to. Yeah. But one of the problems with wild parsnip is that uh, it's very prevalent along uh, roadway highways, mm -hmm. and one of the problems, you know, with that, you know, when, if, when, when we mow, you know, regularly at regular times, when this is in, in bloom, you know, after it's in bloom and the seed's viable, we're actually spreading the, the seed, you know, all the way through. And that's why, you know, some of these, some of these, you know, rural roadways out in, you know, in Verona and Pittsburgh and so forth, probably didn't have much for wild parsnip 30, 20, you know, even 10 years ago, um, just in the 10 years that I was at Pittsburgh, the amount of wild parsnip in the, in the road right of ways you know, really got to be much, much larger. And, you know, but one, one reason for that, obviously, climate change has, has impacted that, but, but just the practices that we have for mowing when the seed is viable can, you know, actually proliferate species like this. And that's definitely one that I've noticed um, it's done that same year. Yeah. I mean, I guess just one quick note, if you do see any of these plants in your yard, um, 
my advice would be to just try to catch it early because if you do, like Rick said, kind of see it after it's already dropped its seeds, it's going to continue causing problems for probably years to come because these seeds are going to be kind of integrated into your garden then. So um, just try to catch them early um, and that should hopefully help alleviate the situation. Yeah. And, and you know, on here, so NR40 is just a natural resources code, 40. Um, so that's a DNR designation um, for what is identified as invasive plants. And so there are there's both uh, restricted plants and uh, prohibited. Yeah, I think I so. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so there's there's different, you know, uh, and some of these, in my opinion, are really bad. I really, I mean, I've seen some Jap Japanese not weed. You know, that's actually my grandfather planted it intentionally around around on the on our property, my you know, the property that he that he bought in 1940. Well, probably the 50s. He probably thought it was a pretty flower and and uh, still proliferates and and. Uh, it's going to take quite a. I mean, this one is the only way that I've I've seen it get addressed is is chemicals, and and uh, you have to it usually takes three or more successive treatments of chemicals to to get it. So if you can keep it from starting, you know, and then if you're if you're mowing it regularly, you know, it's not gonna it's not gonna like being mowed regularly. So some there are different uh, tools that you can use, but if it's an area that you know doesn't isn't practical to mow, then then there's you know you're kind of limited to the number of use, tools that you can use. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of different resources and one of, you know, some of the different, uh, actually a fair amount of the, the information that we've got. So I've got the land and water resource, Dane County Land and Water Resource Department logo in the, in the far left side, ripple effects in the far bottom right side. So some of this is content that, uh, that, I, that I was able to get through rippleeffects.com. Um, and I actually, you know, the, the, you know, Verona's part of what's called the Madison Area Municipal Stormwater uh, Group um, mm -hmm. Partnership. Um, NAMSWAP affectionately known as, um, but uh, so I, there's an information education committee that, that uh, uh, is on that group and I've been able to serve on, on that uh, committee for oh, a little over 20 years since it first started in the, in the um, early 2000s. Um, but, but we, you know, we have a uh, different number of different programs that I'll talk about a little later, but there's some really nice resources that, that uh, um, some of the different colleagues that, that are on the committee and I have, have been able to develop one of the, the um, really good uh, brochures. This is actually the second edition of the Rain Gardens Guide for Homeowners and Landscapers. Roger Vanderman actually helped put this together. This is Roger's home on, I think it's Toke Boulevard area. Um, so not far from Odana, within the Wigger watershed. Um, so this is actually the rain garden that, uh, that I was able to, to, to salvage some of the, the native plants for the Fitchburg Community Rain Garden. Uh, but there's some good uh, resources on, on rain gardens um, at this location at rippleeffects.com. Here's some information on the downspout gardens. There's also a number of different planting plans that are available on rippleeffects.com. Um, you know, looking at different types of sun conditions, you know, it's cold sun to partial shade. You know, these plants will work out really well. Um, so just a, a lot of really good resources on on planting, you know, plans for especially for you know kind of geared, more geared towards residential um, usage. And then uh, as Mercedes mentioned, the plant Dane sale is opening up uh, possibly as early as next week, but basically early February. The the it, it should be available online. Get there fast because they're gonna they're gonna cut the the plants off at thirty five thousand plants. Which sounds like a lot, but uh, we've been we've been you know getting that many plants um, ordered every year. One of the cool things too, you know, by February first, if uh, well, if 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 you if you're you know if you have a school that's interested in plants and or a community group that's interested in tree plants, um, by by next uh, Wednesday, you can actually apply to the plant aid program to get um, native plants. And then as part, when people are ordering, they have the option to actually pay a little extra to, to, to have, so that, so that um, plant day can actually donate more plants to those school groups and you know, school, schools and community groups. So um, Crystal Campbell, our stormwater education coordinator for the program was able to start that maybe four or five years ago. And it's amazing how many people are willing to donate into that. And we're been able to get a lot of native plants into schools and, and various community groups you know, all around Dane County. So that's been a really successful project. Um, and then Teresa Nelson, who works with Crystal at Dane County Land and Water 
resources just started up a, a program where where um, anybody that's interested in actually growing you know so they you know, they come and collect seed from all over the county and even outside the county and then um, is able to give those to to people to actually grow so they can basically grow those plants in your own home and then uh, make them available for for uh for sale later on uh, and for use later on to, to different uh, community groups as well so another great great opportunity the uh, and i actually just we had an information education committee meeting this morning so i just found out that the pickups you know that we've gone to two different days because it's their agricultural actually provides us the, the native plants um um and and they've got they can't do it all in one semi truck so it's in two trucks and then also it's it's quite a lot of i mean it's a lot of you know staffing you know to basically you know, with that many people that are picking up plants anyway so we've gone to a saturday and wednesday program and that's actually worked out pretty successfully and then and here's a link of different plant sources you don't have to worry i mean if, if you mean you're certainly welcome to try to take a picture or or, or write it down it's it's going to be tough to do um, but uh, if you're interested, we've got uh, my and Mercedes contact information at the last page, and you can send us an email. We'd, we'd be happy to send you a PDF that uh, you can then click on one of those different things. Trudy will also have a, a copy of the PDF, but you're welcome to, to email us some if you'd like a copy. And then uh, Trudy's got a number of books over here. Um, these are some of the titles that, that are there. Um, and a uh, great resource for, for learning more about plants. Um, you can, browse them tonight or or um, potentially reserve them you know, check them out as well um you know a couple of those are, are you know, re re resources that i started using back you know before before i started the city of Pittsburgh, i didn't know a lot about native plants i was interested in bird oh yeah pretty native plants will, will improve vegetation well until i actually got to see it in action and learn more about the different species of, of native plants and see how beautiful a lot of the species were and probably the, the way it, I mean, I, I didn't I didn't go through actual formal training like Mercedes has been able to, to take. I, 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 you know, what I found worked really well for me is to actually join a lot of the, the friends of the UWR Arboretum tours and then go and just listen and, and you know, get a, and get my prairie plants in the Arboretum book and, and uh, you know, you know, walk through this you know, portion of it's actually in Pittsburgh and, and be able to, to learn both from that book and being able to have a like, volunteer naturalist talk about uh you know some of the, the the stories behind the plants was really cool to me and so it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. with that uh happy to answer any questions if there's slides that, that uh, you want us to go back to we can we can do that but but uh, we still have plenty of time if, if uh if people have any questions or thoughts or suggestions i guess before before you know i, I entertain any questions i'm curious how many people here are from the city of verona Okay, so pretty pretty large percentage. Anybody from the town of Verona? Mm -hmm. Couple. How about you from the city of Madison? Good. Okay. Anybody from the city of Pittsburgh? Uh, any other communities that I that uh, that I? Have? Okay, Bill's Borga. Okay, nice, awesome, great. Um, well, yeah. Again, any questions that people have, or I mean, are, are people go ahead. So um, I had an experience with trying to put black eyed peas. My backyard. Sure. It was me versus rabbits. Mm -hmm. So now, not so much a problem here. We have less problems with rabbits now since the, uh, the, the box came in, but they're still there. I know they're there. Mm -hmm. So, any cross reference on things that are not only native plants, but also more rabbit resistant? Yeah, Mercedes, do you want to just repeat the, repeat the question for the report? Oh, sure. Yeah. And then if you, I'll let you respond first. Okay. You probably have a better response than me. <laughs> Um, so pretty much your question was any um, ideas on plants that would be maybe more suitable for not being eaten by rabbits or a resource or for the species. okay yeah. I honestly don't can't think of anything specifically besides like fencing or some kind of like physical barrier so, um no, they're, they're, they're experts. they can do those too <laughs> so, so yeah if you tried like chicken wire Fencing because that, that's what that's what's been successful for me more for my my edible um, garden. We we've all gone through just the same things that rabbits and 
Yeah. Yeah, I actually did not know that, so that's good to know. I imagine probably the wild carrot would be a would be a would be a good species. <laughs> be a species that rabbits would like to, right? <laughs> anybody? I mean, anybody else have have thoughts or suggestions on what might work best for for that? Because that's a, that's not something I I've, I've heard about, it, but I, I don't know enough about uh, the vegetation to know which species rabbits do and don't like. Mm -hmm. You just asked that rabbits, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's another trial and error. Yeah, no, I know they don't like them for the smell. Okay. It's too more with all these to know. Well, right. I will well, say, you yeah. know, one of the things one of the things that I have noticed is you know, a lot of times the you know animals will like the early shoots. And this is definitely true of, of just garden vegetables. Um, you know, the early shoots and once they get established. You know, then they're not as 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 interested in in, in those. You know, the early shoots are much much more tender and and uh, yes. Go ahead. Maybe a possible idea. I live in Italy. Partner is a grow apple. Okay. So when they plant the new apple, it's not an apple shoot, but it's a grafting from apple shoot. Oh. To yeah. the, anyway, one apple tree onto the grass. And they're thin um, stems, anyway, they're young, mm -hmm. and the rabbits attack the stems. So this, um, and what he uses is pig blood. Oh. He, he just sprinkles the earth, he has a sprayer, I don't know if he does it, but anyway, he <laughs> the earth, and the ambient repels the that's a good yeah. So so um, one of the responses is pig blood. Um, and I have I haven't heard that before, but I but I have heard um, different types of theories um, that have been put on on early seeding to to try to minimize. The, I'm trying to remember the name of the of the spray. Um, I'll think about I'll think about one of the one of the guys that has found that. Um, especially you know he. he um, in a lot of so, you know, a lot of my experience has been in solar times, and especially in like that that uh, safety shelf area. So the uh, planting certain species there. Well, a couple of solar times have had muskrat activity, and muskrats love a lot of different types of species. Um, and that deer and, and other um, deer off is, I think, the name of the. It, it's the the. It's not the it, deer off. It's the it, but there's it, it's like it, it smells kind of like uh, like it's. Like a salt rich mouth, so like sea lion eggs almost. Um, but there's a uh, few that could be. I have heard in that sense, but that's been successful. Um, and, but, and it's more when there's been seed and then you got the, the early shoes as opposed to the, what I would, would think would work for, for seedlings too of, of native plants. Other questions? Go ahead. I was just going to say, I just talked here. Mm, okay. Were, like, yeah. Yeah. And that's like the rabbit. The plants and rabbits really love. Hmm. Um, it's so quiet a lot, and so that's kind of the now we have. You know, find some boxes that hold the socks underneath. Us, go ahead. It was kind of a follow up to this discussion, but um, if you were wanting to create a larger sanitary area in your backyard in a residential area. Are there issues with that being planted in other rooms? And are there is there any strategy to get a the neighborhood outside? <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, so I do know through the you know some of the experiences that I've had. Um, so the question was, are there are there certain species that, that you would actually bring certain animal species that you'll bring by planting, um, you know, native native plants, especially large areas, um, and that's definitely the case. I mean, you know, taller you know species, you know, that rather than mow the lawn, you're going to have certain species. One of the things species that I've seen a lot more prevalent. In in per, you know, prairies that have been incorporated as prey bowls, so mm -hmm. you get a lot more activity for bowls. It's basically it looks like a little mouse. Um, um, and so you, you, I mean you're going to have certain certain species, and you'll have obviously you know larger animals that, that will see that as as refuge. 
uh, a running shoulder kind of I actually like to have you know taller vegetation because that keeps you know that, that, that allows the, the chance for predators to be in there um to, to minimize the geese, you know, the amount of geese that might be on those shoulder pines. If you mow, typically if you mow, you know, wide right down to the water's edge, and I've seen that around Silent Pine or Silent Street Pine, for example. Um, you know, the city was mowing, you know, right down to the water's edge pretty regularly. Um, you know, it's they're, they don't, at least I don't think they've mowing quite as much. Um, yeah, I'd like to have even a, a bigger buffer, but uh, um, by having you know that a little bit more of a buffer around those summer pines and allowing you know and, and exceeding the working of vegetation, allowing that working vegetation to grow grow in, you'll have other types of wildlife that uh, will be able to, to to live in there and again predate predate uh, um, you know some of the different species that you may or may may not want in in the pond itself. So, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you're going to have likelihood. Going to have increased other other animals that might not be there if it's just a turf grass lawn. Um, oh. um, how do you give them the best? Yeah, yeah. So, so the question was, um, how do I get if I'm using native plugs? How do I get the the best chance for success to to have those those plugs be be um, you know be able to grow up into into good adult plants, right? Into adult, adult native plants. So, you know, one of the keys for me anyway is is looking at what the, the soil is. You know, some certain types of clay are really you know number one they're hard to dig. And if you, you know, just like planting a tree at one of us, you really want to have you know, give a, 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 a young tree the best chance for success. You know, actually, like taking an auger, you know, you know, a three foot auger is ideal. You know, for planting the street trees, for example, and literally, you know, chew, you know, grind up the soil right there. You have to call here's how I know this on a regular basis, but <laughs> but uh, um, you know, getting that soil you know churned up and loose, um, and then. And so, to a certain extent, what I what I found helpful when I'm planting native plugs, you know, and again, the plugs that are available through planting are basically like a, a two inch, yeah. you know, effectively like a one inch to two inch diameter, and it's about four inches, you know, tall. Um, that's what the, the plug is basically called. Um, and um, so I, I, you know, what I like to do is having like a drill with an auger, and then getting you know a couple of inches lower than. And uh, then I want the plant. I want to plant the plant at least, you know, to the flush of the ground or, or slightly in. Um, you know, trees. It's really important to get that that. Uh, you know, what's the the basically the like the root? Yeah, the, remember the, the root player. Mm -hmm. It's important to, to not bury that too deep because um, it'll actually be be problematic for the tree species. I don't know if it's as much of a problem for for native plants for native plugs. But generally, you want to have you know the top of the, the plug be about the top of your soil, maybe you know a half inch depress or something like that. But having you know you know, and I I you know if I can you can actually water them, make sure the soil is nice and, and moist to begin with, it makes it easier for easier digging. Uh, but then you know getting a really good soaking after after planting, and then you know, even though native plants once they're established, they don't, they don't need to be watered for the first you know, the first probably month or two months. If you don't get good rainfall, you want to make sure that you're watering that because you know they're they generally are sending you know, like a, a young seedling for native plants. It's sending its energy into the roots, and and it, it, you know, it does need to have, especially in the first the original development of the roots. You want to have nice, good moist conditions. Throughout. If it's too dry, the desiccate and, and you know it's not going to be able to to thrive. So those are just a, a couple of initial thoughts I have. Mercedes, do you have any other? Um, other thoughts or suggestions? I mean, you kind of mentioned, I would say also like having good, like, um, like seed or um, soil preparation. Um, right. I know like you can't kind of take, if you have seeds, you can't take them and throw them on turf grass because, you know, there's going to be too much competition. So you want to make sure you have like, um, as pretty much contact with the soil, not having any other like competitors around. That'll be um, hard for the, the plant to get established if there's other like turf grass or other kind of like weeds already growing in that spot too. Right. 
And again, you know, no matter what, what type of soil you have, adding compost, if it's sand, if it's silt, if it's if it's clay, adding compost, in my opinion, is, is good on all of those. And, and it's especially important if it's clay soils. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mulching? Mulching, mulching is, I, I, I like to mulch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so in larger areas, I don't, I don't put that all a thick mulch, but I, but you know, like if I'm doing like a larger stormwater facility, I like to use an erosion mat, which is basically a form of a mulch. Um, um, you know, and then you can actually buy a you know, small pieces of erosion mat from from various stores around here if you want to use that for like, for example, downspout gardens, because you want to, you're going to have some energy from a downspout, you know, where where it discharges into into your either downspout garden or onto your lawn. So having an erosion mat or you know, just mulch it, you know, like taking wood chip mulch, um, you might have more likelihood of that wood chip mulch actually migrating when you've got high energy from your downspout, depending on how much area is draining to it. Um, but uh, definitely mulching, you know, there, there's a lot of benefits in the mulching. It helps to retain moisture, um, whether it's wood chip mulch, uh, mulch or, you know, erosion mat, it's going to be, it's not going to retain it as well, but it'll still retain a certain amount depending on what type of erosion mat you're using. But the benefit um, of the mulch, you know, a number of different benefits um, are, you know, especially it's good, you know, when, when you do water, it helps keep that water stay put. And then it, it really reduces the chance that that's going to evaporate um, from the soil. It'll stay by mulching, it, you know, it does that. It also helps to keep um, any weed seeds that might be around it. From, from regrowing, if you've got a, you know, at least a two to three inch thickness of mulch, you know, most weeds aren't going to be able to grow through, through two to three inches of mulch. You know, um, so like the, the um, Japanese knotweed, that can grow through a few centimeters. It grows through pavement, they seem to grow through asphalt mm -hmm. pavement, but uh, most, most uh, weeds are going to be able to grow. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Um, is it important? I'm trying to. Uh, Turn a field that I've had animals on sure. to a native uh, prairie. Sure. Is it important to first spray it like with a herbicide? Well, it all depends. So, you know, the question is, you know, is it important to spray it with an herbicide before converting a field into native native plants? It really kind of goes back to what what's what vegetation is is there right now that you might be concerned about. If you've got, you know, just Kind of non-native grasses that aren't going to necessarily be a problem in in a in a native prairie. It may not be critical to 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 um, put herbicide, but if you do use herbicide, you want to make sure that that you're following the directions on on the bottle. And so certain herbicides, they'll you know they'll basically dissipate very quickly. Like Roundup, Roundup is you know generally dissipates relatively quickly, but there's certain you know um, chemicals that that might you might want to consider doing if you've got some really um, nasty things. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. those, you know, generally, I really try to shy away from from herbicides. But there's some situations that that really the that's really the the, the lowest cost and lowest energy for a combination of that. But so I would say, you know, again, but you know, if you're if you've got a large area, you know, thinking about you know what soils, you know, do a couple of tests because you can actually. I didn't bring. Um, a, I didn't have a, a picture of it, but there's a soil probe that you can check all for free. At uh, UW Extension at Dayton County, mm -hmm. and you know, just you can you can you know get uh, you know do a whole bunch of different soil cores. Generally, it's like a you know the T it's a T probe basically, and that gives you about a three quarter inch diameter um, plug basically. I actually used it to aerate my lawn one time. It was a lot of work. But, you know, <laughs> um, the nice thing is you can get really deep. You, know, you can get you know as much as eighteen inches deep. Um, but uh, that can give you a, a really good idea what soils you have at depth. Um, so be able to see is it clay, is it silt, is it sand, or a combination, is it cobble, you know, it's a whole bunch of stone. Um, but you know, you know, be able to check that out. I mean you can buy them too, but they're like 400 bucks. Um, but uh, you know, just if you're you know, you can get a, a number, number of different uh, um, spots, you know, just to identify what the soil is. And again, you know, sometimes you know, you, like some municipalities actually, like Fitchburg, for example. Um, they, when I was there, we, I was able to set up a compost, composting program for the leaves, and then um, the city actually made compost available to city residents at no cost. So the compost, in my opinion, is almost better than than possible because you don't have as many weed seeds in in your compost. Depending on how it's processed, you can still have weed seeds, but if it's processed well, 
Um, it really minimizes the chance for weed seeds and pecan or separately in a nice seasonal account for versus utilizing pounds of topsoil. But yeah, those, those are I know, any other thoughts or suggestions on the large areas? Um, I would say those are pretty good ones. After you get the, um, I would say after you get the seeds in or if like the native plants kind of established, mowing might, for the first couple of years, you might have to mow more than just kind of once a year, just to yeah. kind of keep back the weeds and give the native plants more of a chance to kind of like, um, compete against whatever's whatever's there right now, um, so that might be necessary too. Yeah, and so when you're if like large areas like that, you know, having your if you depending on what you're using the mow up, you know, a lot of times the native vegetation specialists will will you know use like a a rough cut mower and keep it as high as they can, like a six mm -hmm. inch high, yeah. so they're not you know they're you know they're basically cutting. So by then a lot of the weeds, you know, the the you know the early successional weeds will be up and and starting to flower. You want to you want to basically time your mowing so you're you're cutting any of the weeds off so they're not adding more seed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so th that's a really important thing to once you're because it, it takes it takes you know, even if you're really doing everything right, it can take three to five years to really get um, a, a well a well established native native prairie, and, and sometimes longer if you know if you don't have the the tools at your disposal to be able to to, to do it right. Go ahead. You're planting the, the wooden clubs. How far apart are you? Yeah, so generally, you know, there's generally not much much need to plant closer than a 12 inch spacing. You know, you, you know, obviously it kind of depends on how how quickly you want that to look like a native native vegetation. I personally like an 18 inch spacing, and then to you know to if, especially if I'm doing a you know even like an area like this this size. I like to do a combination of seed and and plugs, mm -hmm. you know, because plugs, you know, you, you get certain species. You're kind of limited, you know, sometimes in the species that you can order. Although I think there's like 50 some species that Plant Dane makes available. It's just that once you start to to to, to narrow that down to what's going to work well in your shade, your your sun or shade conditions, you know, that's you know that's you know less and and the soil depending on the soil types are, you know, that's that's you know fewer and and you know, the moisture conditions, that's something that might be even, you know, you might be down to 10 potential plants that might work. Whereas, you know, you, there's a lot, I mean, a lot of seed mix that is, you know, um, you know, that are, you know, specifically for native prairies, you might have as many as 100 or more species included in some of the really nice seed mixes. You know, obviously, the, you know, fewer species for, for you know, the, the more, you know, more um, cost-effective seed mixes, but, uh, um, you know, I personally like you know 18 spacing, but but with with seeding um, in, interspersed with that, knowing that you know at least the, the plugs should should may flower the, the following year. If you, know, if you get really you know the, the forage plugs, that'll likely flower. You know sometimes they're flowering when you're planting them, um, depending on when you plant. But uh, uh, it's really kind of a you know you know I mean you could do a, a, a wider spacing, but generally I don't see anything more than more than yeah. two feet um, spacing. If there's you know, if you're spending the time on, on putting plugs, but basically that 12 inch to, to two feet is what I have seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? I think that sounds about right. Yeah. Go ahead. What's a good way to browse plants? Like, do they specifically have like now seeding your front garden? I don't know if that's like plants you can't see. Is it a good way to not put the seed to the bit? Right. Yeah, so so the question was, uh, you know, what are what are kind of the preferred broadcasting methods for the seed? Um, I, you know, depending on how big an area, I mean, if I'm doing a large area, I want to have like an ATV with a, you know, and one of those, you know, big cedars on the ATV, and and uh, you know, they're they're pretty good. They're also you can you can either you know rent or you know I, I actually just have one of my own. You know, I used to, to use for just the chirp seed. You know, that the, 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 and you know it works for most native seed. Now some you know native seed you know generally like turf seed is is all a pretty uniform size so, you know like Kentucky bluegrass is is all a uniform size size um, in native seed you'll get some you know you get a wide variation some of the, the like like thistle type you know um, field thistle is very fine you know seed a lot of the different types of native native plants are really small seed so there might be some different things if you're going to use like one of those broad, broadcast things you may actually want to prep the, the seed, adding in some like sawdust I've seen utilized um, just so that, and then and then really fluff it up. Um, so you get the seed, you know, relatively uniform through through the, the whatever you're using to, to broadcast it. 
if, if you're using something like that, you want to be able to add that sawdust or basically get that, um, that you know, as, as uniform as possible. Um, but, you know, if, if you've got a, just a small area, you know, like if it's just a, you know, small rain garden or, or you know, just, just doing it by hand is totally fine. Mm -hmm. There's no need to worry about adding, adding sawdust or, or other types of things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Like just seed to soil context is important. You can even like kind yeah. of do it if you have a small enough area, you can do it by hand and like go through and maybe rake it just to make sure everything's kind of like a little bit incorporated into the soil. Exactly. Yeah. Again, you know, like Mercedes mentioned, that seed to soil contact is really critical, especially for seed. But it's also, you know, getting soil contact for your, for your plug is also really important as well. Um, and then and then getting that moisture and keeping that moisture for the first, at least the first month um, is really critical for. For those roots to start setting for you know, seed to germinate and then and then for the roots to start really putting their, their energy into growing down where, where they can be less susceptible to desiccation. With that, I think we're we're right, we're bumping up. You know, Mercedes and I will be able to stick around for a little bit longer. Again, Trudy, do you want to mention the the some of the books that you've got there? Well, yes, I'd just like to say that you're welcome to browse through these books, you're welcome to check them out if you'd like. Um, so help yourself. And what I would like to say is thank you very much, Mercedes and Rick, for sharing your expertise with us on native plants. We appreciate it. Thank you.